tell you the presence of God is so sweet right now. We could actually close down shop and go home and say we've had church. Oh, he's so good. Last week we uh, dealt with the brazen altar. And let me tell you something. I just barely scratched the surface just on the brazen altar. If we dealt with just everything that we need to bring as a sacrifice to the Lord for to be burnt up in our lives, that list would go on and on and on and on. Let me tell you something. I I really believe right now in the state of the body of Messiah that a good 90 to 95% of all the strife in the home and in the church is because we don't use that brazen altar. There's a lot of things that need to be crucified there of the flesh and of bondages and attitudes. I've had God adjust my attitude so much (laughs) over the years, it's been phenomenal. And yet most of the church will say, well, because of grace, I don't need to do that. No, grace is what gave you access to that brazen altar. Now, I also want to deal with just a couple of other interesting things. When you read about the brazen altar, God commands that there be a ramp that goes up to it. That is what distinguishes God's altar from every single pagan altar. Every single pagan altar has steps because it's, it's like a stairway to heaven. There, there are steps that you must achieve unto enlightenment. In fact, what's interesting is I was trying to find some graphics on the Internet today, and I found this one at a Messianic site. I ran across another one, and I'll be darned, they, didn't, they had steps on the long ramp. And I thought, what? Well, it was a Catholic website teaching, trying to teach on the brazen altar, and there's so much paganism embedded into it, they had to go ahead and add steps to it. And you know, they were there in the northern tribes when they built their own altars. And Dan, and, and I, the other place that just eludes me right now, kind of dropped off my ears. I was getting ready to say it. But those altars had steps to them. And Chad was telling me when, he was, when they were over in the Holy Lands, they went and saw some of them, and all, the, all that was left were the steps. Every pagan mystery religion always used steps. Now, why does God have a ramp? Because it's not steps to enlightenment. It's a journey that we walk with God. In fact, there's another organization that requires steps. Based off the mystery religions, Freemasonry. Every bit of it steps. It's all based on paganism. They in America can put the Bible there. But you go over in the Middle East and they put the Quran. You go into Asia and they'll put the writings of Buddha. How many know that ain't right? God doesn't require us steps. There's one way to the Father, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And so on that brazen altar, it's not steps. In fact, uh, I've, I've heard people preach, you know, 14 steps to faith. And I've been guilty of that in times past. You know, 14 steps to this, 15 steps to that. No, it's just what you gather along the journey. And as you walk with God in that journey, and uh, in, in Christianity, guys, we have gotten so involved in the events. We've made it event-oriented. People want God to do a super whammy on them when they're at church, and they don't have to walk out their own salvation. You see, if you start the journey, all that junk you stuck in your pocket start getting heavy. And the Apostle Paul said, let us throw aside every weight that so easily besets us. Only until you really start walking with God does your junk start getting heavy. And God says, take it to the brazen altar. Let it burn up there. Because what God gives you does not hold you back. It always empowers you. Now, I want to get into the golden candlestick this morning. And to tell you the truth, it's probably going to take me two or three sessions just to deal with everything about the menorah. It, it is awesome. In fact, it is the, the most uh, engraved or the most delicate and the most beautiful of everything in the tabernacle. There's more things wrapped up in it. There's more engravings on it. There, there's, there, there are more uniquenesses to it. It's, it's the most embellished of all the furniture in the tabernacle. And we just kind of overlook it, and then we all look at it and say, well, that's just the Holy Spirit. Well, that's, that's one part of it. But it's so much more. Let's go to Exodus chapter 37, verses 17 through 18. 
And I love the terminology. See if you can pick up this terminology. And he made the candlestick of pure gold of beaten work, made he the candlestick, his shaft, and his branch, and his bowls, and his knops, and his flowers were of the same. Notice it's his, 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 his. You know, sometimes you can read right over that and, and not even pick it up. The six branches go out from the sides thereof, three branches of the candlestick out one side thereof, and three branches of the candlestick of the other side thereof. And what we need to realize, and one of the things I want to get into this morning, is first and foremost, the menorah represents Jesus. It's so interesting, especially when you look at it in the Hebrew. There, there are so many things that I think we miss there. there when... When Jacob's ladder, when Jacob saw the ladder in the Hebrew, that ladder, it says, and he, and he. Not just a ladder, it was Jesus is the one who bridges heaven and earth. And the olive and tav is there. The Bible talks about when they shall pierce him whom they have pierced, that whom they, they, will, they will see him whom they have pierced. In the Hebrew, it says, they shall look upon the olive tav whom they have pierced. We see there was a branch that was supposed to go out of Jesse. It talks about so much about the branch, about the branch, that our salvation was going to be in the branch, and the branch would rebuild the temple. That branch is found in the middle candlestick. And what's so interesting, when you look in the Hebrew here, where it, it talks about out, out of him will go three branches this way and three branches this way, that, that word literally in the Hebrew means thigh, because it's like, it, it's talking almost like so-and-so begat so-and-so. It's talking out of his loins that there were certain things that he begat, that all of it originates with that center candlestick, and it branches out from there. If it wasn't for that center candlestick, none of the rest of it would exist. And where do we see that most clearly? Well, if you read in Revelation, how many know that there weren't seven menorahs that John saw when he was on the Isle of Patmos? It was one. One menorah with seven candlesticks in it. Okay, now listen, it says, And I turned uh, to see the voice of him that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. And so he's telling us who that sinner branches. It is Jesus, and everything that is done, the entire work of salvation is done through him, springs forth out of him. We need to get a vision of Jesus. We, we, you know, when we preach Christ and preach him crucified, we need to understand that all the weakness that we see on the cross, it's our weakness. It's our sin. Yeah, that's good. But we serve a resurrected Lord. And the resurrected Lord we find here in the book of Revelation. This is the menorah. This is the branch that we're dealing with now. And we need to see Jesus strong. We don't need to see him emancipated. We don't need to see him beaten down, carrying a cross. He did that once, and that was our weakness that he was carrying. And once I had really identified with that and received the price that he paid, I need to then begin casting my vision upon who he is now. And let me tell you something. If we really understand who he is now, 95% of what goes on, the craziness that goes on in the church, nobody would dare do if they had a true picture of who Jesus is now. John gives it to us here. Listen to this. He was clothed with a garment down to his foot, gird about his paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hair were, were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were a flame of fire, and his eyes were a flame of fire. Eyes of flame of fire. You don't get, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, there were a couple times in my life my mama's eyes became a flame of fire. How many know that the, the, the dumb stuff stopped right there? But yet people think because of the way that Jesus is preached, we're not dealing with the king. 
We're not dealing with the king that is all-powerful. His eyes are a flame of fire. He's dressed in majesty. He's dressed in purity in that gold girdle. His hair and his, uh, literally white with the glory of God and the power of God. It goes on to say, and his feet were like fine brasses that they had burned in the fire, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Did you ever be around many waters coming together? It's deafening. You can't hear anything else. And John, the one who leaned on the chest of Jesus at the Last Supper, who was the one that Jesus entrusted the care of his mother while he was at the cross. How many know that's some, you know, if, if Jesus had a, a pet disciple, if you will, during his ministry, it would have been John. And when John saw him, he fell, he fell flat on his face as a dead man. Guys, that's who we're serving. If we don't understand that that is the God we are serving, we are serving another Jesus. You see, Mithra doesn't care what you really do. Apollo doesn't care what you really do. You can go ahead and sin and all these different things. But when we see that Jesus is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob manifested in the flesh, he's the one who gave the commandments to Moses on Mount Sinai. Even in Yahweh, Jesus is embedded and coded. yod heh vav -Heh, the God with the nailed hand, shall come or be revealed twice. It's all about Jesus. And he is a glorified Lord. And when he comes back, there's going to be fire in his eyes and he's going to kosher this planet. That's the God that we have to serve. And he is represented in that menorah. Now, this is a representation in Israel of what the menorah looks like. It, you, you see what I'm talking about? All the, all the branches come out of the, the center branch and just how decorated it is. And we're going to get into a lot of the decorations of that and that the top of it is supposed to be shaped like an almond. Almond biblically deals with leadership. When there was a discussion over Aaron being over the high priests and, then, and, God, and God said, Moses had them go stick their staff out in front, of their, in front of their tent, and the one that buds an almond is the one that I've chosen, dealing with leadership. But only leadership can come to you in all the areas of your life when Messiah is the centerpiece. Seven, there's seven branches. Seven represents completeness, spiritual, and perfection. And then we see man in the midst of it that there are six other branches that deals with the weakness of man, the evils of Satan, and the manifestation of sin. You take that center branch out, you don't have a leg to stand on. If, if Jesus is not the center, you don't have a leg to stand on in anything that you do in your life. And this world, as smart as they think they are. You know... I, I marvel at Washington sometimes. You know, you know, the reason we're having the problems we do in Washington, they, they've left Jesus out of the equation. They have, they have tried to make it secular, take God out of the equation, yet at the same time, they'll run after everything pagan that they can because Freemasonry is based upon paganism. They all get involved in that. Just don't pray in the name of Jesus. Just don't mention his commandments. Now, you can do anything else you want, but just don't deal with those. And it just amazes me that in the Supreme Court where there, where there has gone before them about displaying the Ten Commandments, how you can't do that because of separation of church and state. In America, the highest number of displays of the Ten Commandments on any F edifice in Washington, D.C. is the Supreme Court. It's like, you guys are blind. When you take God and his commandments out, you turn, off, you turn over everything to the devil. You take away the seventh one, you take away that sinner one, and all you're left with is the weakness of man, the evils of Satan, and the manifestation of sin. But you put Jesus in the middle of it, man has salvation. You have divine government when he's in the center of it. And notice he is in the center. He is the epicenter 
of our lives. He is the epicenter of our moral standards. He is the epicenter of our compassion. He is the epicenter of all of it. If he is not, it all falls apart. And I'm listening to what's coming out of Washington, guys. I really am. You have a freight train, a bullet train, at going 250 miles an hour. It's called the national deficit. And half of them will say, will say, now let's don't back off the throttle. Let's just kind of tweak the brake a little bit. And the other ones are saying, there is no train. There is no train. There is no train. How many know that train's coming? But see, what happens in this nation, what happens with the economy, we have got to be a part of a kingdom that transcends it. I am a citizen of the kingdom of God first, and that middle candlestick is my my Messiah, and everything that I need in life to, to overcome my weakness, to overcome my incompleteness is found in him. And if I have learned to draw from him, it doesn't matter what they do, he takes care of me. Christianity thrives in China. Christianity thrives in Russia. Christianity is foundering in America because in our affluence, we have said, I've got enough in my little stem of the, of the, of the menorah and I don't need that centerpiece. And so what are you stuck with? Weakness. The evils of Satan. The manifestation of sin. You know what? It's, it's getting to the place in America that it's going to become illegal to call sin, sin. That's a hate crime. And they're telling you that you're committing a hate crime as they beat you to death with a billy club. Yep. No, that's totalitarianism. isn't that? That's the devil raising up trying to, to push down the commandments of God and the ways of God. Oh, mercy. How do, and, well, the menorah, the seven-step plan of God, the feasts are encoded into the menorah. There's seven. How many know we're still at that middle one right now? Shavuot is about preaching the gospel. It's about walking in the power of what Messiah did for us. And as we stand in it, we will be prepared for what he's going to do when we get to the other three branches, the fall feasts. But I want us this morning to also look at something else because if you notice that you have a sinner vine, you have six branches. You know, Jesus talked about that in John chapter 15. He was actually, he was preaching about grapes and preaching about the menorah all at the same time. John chapter 15, verses 3 through 10, and I want you to count just how many times we see the word abide. Abide means connected. Connected to the branch. You are clean through the word that I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth fruit. Much fruit. How many like much fruit? If you're going to get fruit, might as well get much. You know, if you're going to have an apple tree, better to have one that gives 500 apples than one that gives five. God wants us to bear fruit in our lives, and as we bear much fruit, he's glorified. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. And that right now is what's happening to the church in America. Because we have not abided in him, we have some pseudo-spirituality that, that preaches the cross, but really doesn't preach the cross. It likes grace instead, and it's greasy grace. I call it gopher grease grace, that... We wither away. The church is withering away. There is no power. There is no conviction. 
and it gives the power for secular society to cast you in the fire and to burn you up and to say you have no relevance whatsoever to society. It's because we're not connected to the branch. We're not connected to him. Then he goes on to say, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. That's a powerful statement. Why aren't more people getting prayers answered? They're not abiding. Because if I'm abiding in him, I'm going to pray what Jesus would have prayed in that same situation. I'm going to pray the word of God. I'm not praying out of my flesh. I'm praying out of my spirit that which Messiah has done in me. Isn't that what James was dealing with? He says, you have not because you ask not, and you, and you ask amiss because of all your carnal desires that were supposed to be burnt up on the brazen altar. There's a difference between saying, God, I need a new car because mine's broken down, and my mechanic said what we need to do is to slide it off and to put a whole new car underneath it. Now, it's a different thing asking God for a new set of wheels than it is, well, I don't have faith unless I ask him for a Lexus. How many know you can't afford a Lexus if you're working at McDonald's? And yet we see people ask so many goofy things. They're asking beyond where they are, because their flesh, instead of God, just give me something reliable that goes down the road. I like for the air conditioner to work in the winter, the summertime, and I like for the heat to work in the summer, and I like for the brakes to work, thank you very much. And I don't necessarily want the wind to come whistling through all the holes in the body either as I go down the road. But we get, we get the status symbol and everything that goes on in America, and we stretch ourselves beyond what we should instead of asking for what we really need by abiding in him. As I abide in him, he changes my wants. He changes me. And I learn that when I do, I begin asking what he would ask. And of course, if, you know, how many know Jesus got every prayer answered? Every single prayer answered. And when I pray in his name, and this is something we've taught here a lot, that when I pray in the name of Jesus, that is not a magic formula to put on the end of your prayer to make the Father give you what you asked for. Right. And it's been preached that way. Whatever you ask him in Jesus' name, he's got to give it to you. No, you better make sure that what you're praying reflects who Jesus is right. because you're coming in his name, and it better be in his character. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, and so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love if. Uh oh. We're about to find the key to abiding. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Church, the only way that we can abide in Messiah is out of love and respect for him to keep his commandments. And we have a church today that says, because of Jesus, I don't have to keep the commandments of God. Then you're not abiding in him. The question is, we got to ask, what are they abiding in? It's not him, it's impossible. Guys, we find the word abide nine times in verses 3 through 10. Nine times. Nine is the number of the fruit of the Holy Spirit and divine completeness from the Lord. The only way you're ever going to be complete is to abide. And see, in Hebraic repetition, the superlative is three. And so he did the superlative three times in these few verses. I think that's for maximum effect. If we don't abide in him, we can draw nothing. We, we don't understand about the commandments. The commandments, there are, there are channels that come into the menorah. There are channels right here that open up because right here is where all the oil is. Right here is where all the oil is. And as I keep his commandments, it opens the channels for me to draw upon the anointing. God's commandments strategically place me in the right spot for victory. 
It places me in the right spot to have the best of what God wants for me, the best of what God wants for my family. It puts me in a spot that is the hardest to reach by the enemy. Now, we can flip that around. What, what is sin? The violation of the commandments, the violation of Torah, according to 1 John. When I sin, it shuts down God's anointing and allows me to draw from another anointing. Lucifer has an anointing. He was called the anointed cherub that covers. He has an anointing. It is an anointing that perverts. And when I sin, I draw in things that begin to pervert me and begin to place me in places that's hard for God to get to because God isn't going to mess with sin except to tell you to repent. It puts you in a place that he can't hear your prayers. He, the Bible says that our sins, our iniquity, have hid his face from us. But it puts us in a place that we are within easy reach of the devil. He has us. He can take us captive at his will. We're, we're playing his game. And how many people in the church do I see the devil can take them anytime he wants to? Anytime. Just turn her life upside down anytime. We dealt with that with when years ago when we had the occult coming after us, and, and we, I shared a little bit about all the assassins and the different things, and we saw them take out pastors anytime they wanted to, either through sickness and disease or car accidents. Why? None of them were keeping the commandments. They didn't know their theology had taught them not to keep the commandments. When we began to quit doing the Christmas and Easter and all the pagan things, started keeping the Sabbath, started keeping the feast and keeping the commandments, the occult went crazy. It shut down all their doors. And all they had left was a rumor mill. And you know, to me, if you're going to do rumors, you might as well make them intelligent ones. One of the rumors to this day was, I know Mike Lake's in the occult because he wears an upside-down Star of David. First of all, I won't wear a Star of David because it's a hexagram. Second of all, if you can get that bad boy upside down, you're a better man than me. <laughs> Just take it, turn it, upside down, right side up. Had to work on that one just a little bit. But the, I think what that did is that showed their frustration. It showed their frustration. God wants us to get to a place, guys, in this day and this hour, we better align ourselves with the vine. We better align ourselves with that center candlestick. And everything that we have in life has got to draw out of him. If it doesn't draw out of him, it's bad juice. <laughs> it, it, it's bad anointing. It's something else. The secret of, rela of releasing the power of Messiah, guys, is learning to abide in Messiah. Really abide in him. Now, we need to understand the power of a crucified life. Because this is where it gets, how many have seen people that keep the feasts and, and keep the commandments, but you wouldn't want to be 500 yards around them? A religious spirit the size of Detroit. And the reason is, they've never used a brazen altar. The flesh, the flesh will either nullify the commandments. Jesus said the traditions of men nullify or make void the commandments of God. And it will either do that or it will team up with religious spirits to contaminate it and pervert it. I have seen people that, that talk about, you know, people ask about Christmas or ask about some of these different things or why do you do what you do? And I have seen their response have such a bad attitude, such condensation, you know, condemnation, condensation, no condemnation. <laughs> there might have been condensation flying in the air, a spittle or something. Condemnation that, that flows with that, that anybody with half a brain would reject it. It's like, I don't want anything that you're doing. We've seen that. They have never been to that brazen altar. They've never been to the cross and let that flesh and that stinking attitude yeah. be burned up. Right. We can say it out of love. I've, I've been able to say it out of love even when, they're say, even when they're getting mad at me and they're beating me over the head saying, you're being mean to me. No, you're the one beating me. Stop just for a minute. Listen. 
Who's the one raising their voice? Who's the one saying, blah, 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 blah? It's not me. But yeah, don't you judge me. I'm not, but you're judging me right now because I don't do your stuff. Let's just stop and look at this just for a minute. If you can ever stop them barking long enough to go, huh? <laughs> who's barking here? Who's getting mad here? Who's putting who down? Who's judging who? That's right. If you'd have been drawn from the branch, you wouldn't have had that. In fact, I've had brothers that walk in God, and they're just going by what they, what they had learned. The same thing I was taught in seminary. You sit down and open scriptures, and instead of going, ha, <laughs> they go, Huh. Show me more. Let's consider this. Let's look at this. Let's look at the, the history of this thing. And you begin to see the wheels turn and begin trying to, you know, put the pieces together because every one of us had to do that. Every one of us had to do that. But if you let a religious spirit that gets a hold of flesh that never was burned up, it'll take the commandments and it will turn it into bondage. Isn't that what the Pharisees did? They took the simple commandments of God and they made them where nobody could do them. How do you know keeping the Sabbath is really simple? But, I, you know, but the, the rabbis, there, there's a new series right now going out on, on Sabbat which is about all the laws of Sabbath. I think it's six or nine volumes. No. Remember the Lord. Don't do work. I mean, just some basic things. Honor him on the Sabbath. Rest. I mean, no, gathering sticks ain't a good thing to do either on the Sabbath. <laughs> we find that out. Of course, back then, actually, making a fire was a hard thing to do. Now all it takes is a flick of a bick and some dryer lint, and phew, you got a, you got a fire going. But guys, we've got to understand that even if, even if we're in the commandments, if I don't use that brazen altar, the devil could actually use me as an agent to turn people away from it. That's why you've you got to do the brazen altar before. You see the, the, the outer court is a very wide place everybody needs to get. But once you've really done your work there, then everything begins to narrow. It's a little place to go into the holy place. It's a little place. It's more restrictive. To abide in Messiah is more restrictive. But you know what? There's freedom in boundaries. There are freedom in boundaries. Boundaries are a good thing. God says, here are the lines. You step out. You step out in, in the devil's territory where he can take you captive at his will. He will have a right to destroy your life, destroy your marriage, destroy your business, destroy your joy. But if you keep within these boundaries, he's not supposed to be able to get in. And if he does try to sneak in, you have the authority to drive him out. You can't drive the devil out of his territory, but you can God's. Absolute freedom. You put kids in a fenced-in backyard where the bad things can't get to them, and they can't get out. They can go play, climb on trees, do all the wonderful things kids do, and they know as long as they stay in the backyard, they're safe. And all you got to do is look out the back window to know exactly where they are to check on them. But what would absolutely cause fear in the heart of a parent is that they look out and the kid has strayed beyond the boundaries. Why? Why do we tell them? Danger. Danger. Then there's stranger danger too, okay? But we, we tell them outside these boundaries there are dangers. And God loves us. And how many know he tells us the same thing? There are certain things that won't kill you the moment that you do them. Let me tell you something. They begin taking over your life, and I know a few believers that wish they would have died <laughs> because of all the misery those things added to their lives. And then God's got to work us out. Guys, it is impossible to walk in the commandments of God until the cross of Messiah is fully preached and embraced. There are groups right now that don't preach Messiah that try to preach the commandments. How I many all that is is legalism? All it is is legalism. It'll turn into Phariseeism. There's even a lot of Messianic congregations right now. This, this, is, what, this is what really frustrates me, I guess. 
is you had them that seldom ever mention Jesus, except in passing. Oh, yeah, he's Yeshua. You know, they get mad if you say Jesus, but then they never tell what he ever does. They never preach the cross. And they try to preach the commandments without first going through the cross. What you end up with is dead religion. Dead religion, guys. I don't want that. It is only in a crucified life that the Holy Spirit can empower us to walk the commandments and to fully abide in Messiah. Without Jesus, you have nothing to hold it up. Absolutely nothing to hold it up. For me to get into any more this morning, it would take another hour. But let's start right here. Are you really tapped into that center branch? Are you really tapped in? Are you walking the commandments because you love him, that you're in him this morning? I mean, this is the time for us to do a heart check because it is so easy to wander. It is so easy to get caught up in so many other things that I'm not really connected to the vine the way that I'm supposed to be. And with the winds that are coming, how many know there's a storm coming? You better be fastened into the vine. I want to be so anchored in him. And here's here's a secret. Get so anchored in him, you can't tell where he ends and you start. Come on now. I've got to be fully in Messiah. I've got to be completely tapped into him. I've got to make sure everything is under the blood. The feast teaches us a cycle of repentance and getting it under the blood and to making sure that I'm right with God. There are cycles of sanctification that I need to go through because every year God wants to take me through another layer. He wants to show me something else. He want, the, the whole thing of the feast, every year, I get rid of something so that I can receive something. And you can't receive until you get rid of. I can't receive his righteousness until I give up my sin. I can't, get, I can't have the attitude of doing rightly until I get rid of iniquity. I can't thank his thoughts to have the mind of Christ until I start getting rid of mine. I can't receive his healing until I let go of my pain. Oh, guys. The cross and the brazen altar are almost the answer for everything. Did you know that? How do we tear down a stronghold? Fire. Fire. God's got to burn it out. God's got to burn it out. I, I have the power of God to pull down strongholds, but then I got to let the Lord cleanse it by fire. Isn't that what God told them every time they would take a city? Cleanse it by fire? But anytime they took it in conquest, you could cleanse it by fire. If it couldn't be by fire, it had to be by water. But it had to be cleansed. Wash it out, burn it out. And God, our prayer needs to be, Lord, burn out of me the chaff. Burn out of me the hurts of the past because the devil was so strategic. He knew that if I got rid of this thing, I'd be something for you. That's the reason you got hurt growing up. That's the reason you got hurt in places of your life is the devil knew what you could do if you were just tied into the, into the vine when, and let that flow with no hindrances at all. And so he said, I've got to create a stronghold. I've got to create something to stop the flow. For some, it's pride. For some, it's pain. For some, it's prejudice. We've got to take a hard look and ask God to burn those things out of our lives, to bring it to the cross, and to bring it under the blood. Because once we do, there is this divine exchange that takes place. Because as his anointing flows, it washes out the old, and it begins to bring in new. And that's my greatest desire for you guys today is for God to begin taking away the pain or taking away the things the devil has done in your life. You say, well, Mike, how do I do that? Here's how I've done it. I've taken that thing to the brazen altar. And I say, Lord, I give it to you. I I repent of anything that I had to do with it. If people did wrong to me, 
to put it there, I now forgive them because I'll not be bound to that thing. I release them. If it's something that I've done, I ask that you forgive me. And I sit there and I praise him for my freedom and I stay there and worship him and just ask for the blood of Jesus to cover it. And I stay there and I stay there and I stay there and I stay there until it's reduced to ash. And sometimes the longer it's been there, the longer it takes to burn up. But when the last part of it falls from the grate... I'm free because it's the journey. I've had God bring up things to me that I couldn't even remember anymore, things that happened to me when I was a kid and I made a judgment against somebody. Things that were way back here that if you asked me this off, off the cuff, Mike, did this ever tell me? Well, I can't remember that ever happening. And the Holy Spirit, when he brings it up, he brings it up with all the emotions. Everything comes with it so that I can deal with it. Mike, how do you feel? I was mad. I judged them. Ooh, I judged them. Oh, Lord, forgive me for judging them. I responded wrong. I didn't respond out of your grace. I forgive them. I release them. This thing's no longer going to hold me in bondage. That's the job of the Holy Spirit in our lives so that we can be free. He doesn't, he doesn't ever do it to be mean. How many know that? The Holy Spirit doesn't do it to be mean. He says, this has got you anchored to the past. This has got you anchored, and this anchor is tied around your neck, and I'm trying to get you free. And as I do, it's the power of the cross. It's the power of Messiah's blood that sets us free so that we can move forward. Father, I just thank you for your word this morning. Father, I believe right now, Father, you're showing us things that need to be brought to the brazen altar. Father, you're showing us things that, uh, that has held us back, that has impeded the flow of what Messiah came to give us. And Father, we want our branches in him to flow unhindered. Lord, we just bring it to you right now. Father, we confess it before you. And we ask that you would forgive that you would cleanse, that right now, Father, that you'd begin healing the wounds, healing our emotions, taking away false concepts and, 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 and false philosophies of the, the devil's school of hard knocks of what he tried to bring us through to set us up for failure. And Father, we just ask the Holy Spirit would continue to work all week to prepare us so that we could have a sanctified temple for your use. And Father, we thank you and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name.